What's up, my wizards? It's Deb from SBMTG. We like it of magic and whatnot, and we are we have arrived, everybody. It's the final day of Pharaoh's preview season, so we got a big old video for you today. Wizards released, according to Mythic Spoiler, like 80 cards today, which is crazy. I mean, we, we got all the cards from the leaks that a lot of a lot of them we already knew about, but they were officially spoiled today, so we got a lot of cards to go through. Normally, when I do the final preview video of the season, they do the common and uncommon dump. You know, they put 80, 100 cards out or whatever. I usually give you my top 20 cards of the day, but no. We're not going to do it. We're going to do it right. We're going to go deep on this one, and we're going to talk about every single card that got previewed today. So you may notice we're doing things a little different. I'm just doing screen recording for this one, so I don't have to go through a you know, middleman editing process. You know, allow me that for the last <laughs> preview video of the season. So before we really get into it here, you already see we're going to talk about Labyrinth of Scofos. But before we get into it, just a quick aside here. Make sure you like the video. I want to go ahead and do the call to action at the beginning here. So you're more likely to maybe actually do these things. <laughs> like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet, because we're almost at deck deck season. And in between there, we're going to do, you know, pre-release guide and a bunch of lists, top 10 cards in the set, or, you know, maybe top 25 cards in the set. Uh, I've got a few ideas, the top 10 sleepers, all that. So make sure you're subbed, hit the bell for notifications, and check out the Patreon, link in the description. Just throw in a dollar a month, and I'll let you vote on what decks you want to see this season. The first poll starts next week, so get in there if you haven't done it yet. Got a lot of new patrons already this month. I want to welcome y'all aboard and say what's up, and thank you very much to all of my longtime patrons. Y'all have been with me for a, a forever now, so I really, I literally could not do it without you. Thank you so much. But <laughs> If you're interested in the Patreon, go over there, link in the description. But let's go ahead and get it started here with Labyrinth of Scophus. A couple of other YouTubers have already covered this card in the last few days, but this is the first time I'm getting to it. This is just a land that taps for a colorless, or you can pay four and tap it to remove an attacking or blocking creature from combat. So it's a maze of if effectively that actually taps four mana. That's, <laughs> we'll see that every day. It's like the only drawback to maze of if is that it's a land drop. You can't actually juice mana out of it. This you can. So it's kind of nice to be able to squeeze some colorless out of it, but I'm not really sure how good it actually is. Four mana is so much to ask, and it's actually technically five mana. So you're tapping Labyrinth as well. So just a huge, huge taxing of your resources there. Your opponent's going to swing first. You're going to remove their biggest creature from combat. That's going to tap down all your lands, and they're going to get in a clean play in their second main phase. I'm just not a huge fan, even in control decks, especially considering three color control decks are going to be playing like Castle Vantress and Cat the Loxwain. So they need a bunch of, you know, islands and swamps, and this does doesn't cut the mustard, you know, like Blast Zone doesn't really see much play in three color control decks, so I don't know that this will either. But it is a pretty decent piece. If you open it at the pre-release, you you want that. So <laughs> let's move on to Thundering Chariot here. Chariot is four mana for an artifact. It's a vehicle, and it's 3-3. Three, three. It's a first strike and trample and haste, and it has crew one. I actually kind of like this, but probably not as much as I would in other sets, just because this is such like an aura, an enchantment heavy set, and you can't actually stick any of these auras onto Thundering Chariot. It'd be sweet if you could, because it has three really, really good um, just keyword abilities. You know, first Strike is especially really good on a three-power creature in Limited. So I would probably play one copy of this, especially if I had like a bunch of other small creatures lower on the curve because I really like the keyword abilities on it. But I'm not a big fan of the fact that you can't stick auras to it. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to, to Tomaturge, Tomaturge's Familiar here. <laughs> this is three mana for a 1-3 artifact bird with flying. And when it ETBs, you scry one. That's the entire card. So, I don't know, we've seen takes on this, what was it, Sky Scanner, I believe, the 3 mana 1-1 one, one that draws you a card when it ETBs, which is probably better than this, but I do like that this has a reasonably high toughness in the air, and it's going to block a lot of, like, 2 power flyers, and there are a lot in any limited environment, and this one is no different, so I actually don't think this is a terrible card, and again, if you're looking for a, you know, 22nd, 23rd card for your deck, and you could do a lot worse than Familiar, I like that any deck can play it, and Scry is pretty good for, again, just about any deck in sealed. So for the limited environment, I like it, which is true of most of these cards, but not necessarily Hero of the Nyxborn. I think this might actually have some legs. This is three mana, one, a red, and a white for a 2-2 two -two human soldier. And when it ETBs, you create a 1-1 one -one white human soldier creature token. And whenever you cast a spell that targets Hero, creatures you control get plus one, plus up till end of turn. That's, I mean, pretty good. We, we keep seeing this ability over and over, this sort of pseudo-heroic thing 
on some of the creatures in this set, and I actually really like it on this because it's relatively aggressively costed. You not only get 3-3 three, three worth of stats, but you get it on two bodies. So when you do cast a spell that targets it, you get much more use out of the pump ability to towards all your creatures. Plus imagine like second turn here or precinct one, third turn this, and you effectively get like three creatures on the board for that. That seems great. And then if you ever target hero with something, then suddenly you get you know, a huge boost. It seems really, really good. I say hero. I mean hero of Nyxborn, not Precinct 1. In that example, you just play the hero of deck. <laughs> Boros hero of. Um, and that might actually kind of work in standard because you're really developing your board quickly in that situation. But I'm not too sure. Like, even the feather deck that it looks like the slots into probably doesn't want this card, truly. It's... I'm really just excited about it for Hero Precinct 1, but even then I'm not too sure. But either way, you know, again, back to Limited, this is a fantastic card that's a lot of stats, a couple of bodies for three mana, and even more stats if you have some, some ways to target heroes. So huge fan of it in that format, but I'd like to try it in like budget Hero Precinct 1 decks or something. But I'm going to move on to Warbriar Blessing. This is one and a green for an aura that enchants a creature you control. When an ETB's enchanted creature... Oops, sorry if that was a big bump there i just hit my mic <laughs> whenever um when warbriar Bless blessing enters the battlefield enchanted creature fights up to one target creature you don't control that is so good enchanted creature gets plus o plus two by the way too so it can survive that fight it sucks that it doesn't get any like, extra power but it would probably have to cost more and to be honest i think that two mana is what i want to be paying for this if it was like the creature gets plus one plus two and fights something but it costs three mana it would still be playable but not nearly as playable in my mind two mana is a really really good rate for a card like this, especially considering it leaves the creature with an everlasting toughness bonus. That's so good. You know, it allows two twos to take down, you know, other two twos and survive and stuff. Same thing, you know, it allows like three twos to take down three threes and survive. That's really, really good. So I kind of kind of really like Blessing because it's effectively a removal spell that's also an aura, triggers any enchantments, synergies, or anything. So just a really hot common for Limited right there, which is mostly, again, what we saw today. But I like usually these common dumps are just filling out the Limited environment, letting you know what to expect or whatever. Just almost every card they dropped today looks really hot and Limited. Like Voracious Typhoon here. This is four mana, two and two green for a 4-4 four, four Snake Beast that escapes for seven mana and exile four other cards. But it escapes with three plus one plus one counters on it so if you ever get it to escape it's suddenly a seven seven so very late in the game this can be a pretty well statted thing that doesn't actually cost you you know a draw it doesn't cost a card from your hand or anything and that could be really serious but honestly just a four mana four four is decent stats in and of itself in the limited environment again this is common so we're just seeing so much bread and butter stuff and not just for green but green is getting kind of a lot of stuff now we're in sort of the green uh, cluster here <laughs> on Mythic Spoiler, so let's keep going through here. And look at Scola Grove Dancer. This is two mana, one and a green for a 2 2 enchantment creature. That's a Satyr Druid. And whenever a land card is put into your yard from anywhere, you gain a life. And you can pay two and a green to put the top card of your library into your graveyard. This, too, I, I think is just like a couple of hairs off of standard play. Just barely, but it probably doesn't see too much play. Although, this first line of text, whenever a land's put into your graveyard from anywhere, you gain a life. That's so interesting. Whether it's put to your graveyard from your hand or the battlefield or your library, even. Gaining a life is actually not terrible, um, especially considering it's a, you know, it's a bear. It's a two mana two two with a decent uh, little triggered ability there, but it's also got an activated ability, so it's a neat little mana sink for um, for limited two. So I think it's actually really sweet. And I mean, a bear with a triggered and activated ability is like almost standard playable, right? But not again. I don't think quite so in this case. But we'll see if like. I don't know, Pride Maid decks will go Abzan or something. Again, I, that sounds silly, right? So I doubt it. <laughs> Let's move on to Satessan Training. This is one and a green for an aura that enchants a creature you control. And it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus zero, and has trample. I've talked about this a lot this season. I love how many auras are breaking the rules of auras. Right? We've seen white and blue enchantments auras for two mana that give creatures flying and draw a card. And I've always thought that those were good auras. Honestly, and this is kind of reminiscent of that, because when an R comes into play, you draw a card that just effectively negates the fact that you get two for one if your creature dies. That's a huge deal. Just And honestly, this is a decent boost, too. Plus one, plus oh, and trample, not bad at all. Trample is going to be very, very significant on a large number of creatures in Limited. So, you know, we've kind of been waiting on the good R's. 
all season. We've seen a few of them so far, but the majority of the decent limited playable are has dropped today, and a lot of them are common and uncommon. So it looks like it's going to be fairly easy to get some, play them, get the value out of them. And when it comes to stuff like success and training, you know, you don't have to worry too much about getting blown out if your creature dies or something. You do still have to worry about them pointing removal at your creature before you even resolve success and training. So do be on the lookout. But if you stick success and training, it doesn't really hurt so bad if your creature actually does die because you ultimately didn't get two for one. But let's move on to Satessan Skirmisher here. Another two mana creature, one in a green, for a 2-1 human warrior. With Constellation, whenever an enchantment ETB is under your control, oh. Skirmisher gets plus one, plus one till end of turn. So again, really good limited common here because it's got decent baseline stats. Just a two mana, two power creature is at least playable as filler. But if you do have a bunch of enchantments in your deck, which you very likely will, there's going to be times where this can get up to four power or five power even, depending on what you're doing on your turn. So I do like it as a curve filler, but it doesn't really go too far beyond that. So I'm going to move on to Omen of the Hunt here. This is just two and a green for an enchantment with flash. That is probably the most important part of the card. All the omens have flash, but this is mana ramp with flash. When Omen of the Hunt enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tap, shuffle your library. You can also pay two and a green, sack it, and scry two like all the other omens, which is a good ability, but I really like this. I think of all the cards we've seen today, this might be one of the top ten in terms of like ability to actually see standard play, because you don't often see instant speed ramp like this you know we have gross spiral in the format but that's just about it and gross spiral is one of the only cards we've ever seen you know few and far between at least that allow us to ramp at instant speed and that can be very very important so i could definitely see some decks playing this uh not necessarily you know cynic flash or anything it would have to be a very specific kind of deck but now between gross spiral and this we do have a way for the cynic ramp decks to operate at instant speed for the first couple of turns of the game and that might actually prove really important although all things considered in most ramp decks i'd probably rather play beans than this and beanstalk giant but still, Omen of the Hunt definitely gets, it gets a look. It gets a look because it's ramp, and it also gives you a mana sink later in the game to do something with your mana if you, you know, draw dead for a turn or something. So that's kind of important. Make sure you don't draw dead on the next couple of turns, right? So I really like Omen of the Hunt just, be, just because of the word flash, but... Let's move on here to Nylea's Huntmaster. This is four mana, three and a green for a four, three centaur shaman. And when it ETBs, target creature you control gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is your devotion to green. That's very good. You know, look at the stats on this. Four mana, four, three, definitely playable in and of itself right there. That's pretty decent. But when it ETBs, you give your two or three drop you know, plus two plus O, or two, plus three or four plus O. If it's really late in the game, uh, especially in sealed, if you're getting into a stalemate of some kind, and this does look like kind of a stalemate sealed, but in any case, if you're late in the game, you might be able to give a creature, you know, plus seven plus O or something like that and get through for trample damage. Like that, this looks like a very good card to me. And a lot of these commons today are, by the way. I mean, again, I'm giving you the impression, but just because the green cluster came first, that green is just overpowered <laughs> at the common level. But no, most of the colors got really good commons today. But let's move on to Nexus Wardens. This is three mana, two and a green for a Satyr Archer that uh, is a 1-4. And it has reach. Constellation, whenever an enchantment eats beasts under your control, you gain two life. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll probably take it, especially if you're in like kind of a slower uh, limited deck that's trying to develop its board, get a little bit later into the game, then you've got a creature with really decent toughness. I mean, four toughness is great. And you've got a little bit of life gain. And you'll probably end up gaining like six, eight life <laughs> from this over the course of the games, depending on how your deck is built. So really a big fan. Even if you only gain two or four life from it, it's still fairly costed. So fan of Nexus Wardens, like the card. But let's see. Next, we got Moss Viper. I don't, I don't even know why I'm clicking on the page for this one. <laughs> this is just a 1-1 a one, one death touch for one mana. And it's a snake. And I like these creatures in limited. I've always liked 1-1 one, one, one mana death touches in limited. I will continue to play them until magic is no more, which is hopefully never. So let's move on to Elysian Caryatid. This is two mana, one and a green for a 1-1 one, one plant. I just love the creature type plant. <laughs> it always seems so anticlimactic. For a 1-1 one, one plant, you tap to add one mana of any color. If you control a creature with power four or greater, add two mana of any one color instead. Very good. Like, maybe standard playable good. This is insanely good, right? 
I'm not saying that it's like better than Paradise Druid. Paradise Druid is much better, mostly, until you have a creature power four or greater. But I like the Hexproof on P. Diddy. But at the same time, this is just, you know, something you can play instead of Incubation Druid that effectively allows you to create any color mana for, for just a two mana investment. It is a little bit fragile, but eh, I don't know how big of a deal it is unless you're playing against like Mayhem Devil or something, you know, something that specifically shoots stuff for one damage. So. I do like it, you know, two mana for this kind of ramp is always really good, but it is a little bit fragile. That said, as soon as you drop a Lovestruck Beast or something, it taps for two, and it's a really dangerous permanent, so really, really like this. A, kind of an awful lot. Again, I, I'm not a big fan of the stat line on it, but just anything that costs two mana and taps for any color is definitely worth paying attention to, and I'm talking about in standard at this point. This could actually see some very real play, because tapping for two of any color eventually, you know, without too much investment honestly you know love struck beast rotting registrar shifting ceratops night pack ambusher there's just a million green creatures that people play you know, wicked wolf whatever that get to four powers so this will tap for two before you like really really quick so i really like carry added i think that it might actually see some real standard play one of the better cards of the entire day but moving on to hydra's growth a lot of people really like this thing this is two and a green for an aura that enchants a creature when an etb you put a plus one plus one counter on enchanted creature and at the beginning of your upkeep you double the number of plus one plus one counters on said enchanted creatures so this is actually awesome obviously if you start with a creature with nothing but plus one plus one counters on it so like walking ballista hilarious um same thing with like pelucranos you know, it's going to have either 6 or 12 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So eventually, you know, if it starts with 12 when you escape it, you get 24 the next turn. Um, actually, 26, yeah, because you'll put another counter on it when this ETBs. The next turn, you'll double it. So I'll have 26. That's just, that's insane. <laughs> same, same thing with, like, Stone Coil Serpent. You know, slap this on a 5-5 five, five stone, coil, uh, stone Coil Serpent. And then next turn, it'll be like a 12-12. That seems good. So I actually think this is like a really sweet little aura, but it is very, very slow, like in insanely slow. So I don't know how much I actually like it for standard play, um, especially considering you're kind of just asking to get blown out when you go to resolve the aura in the first place. But at the same time, it is pretty exciting. I just don't like stuff that, you know, snowballs over multiple turns because a lot of times in standard magic, you actually don't have multiple turns. So let me just move on here. We're finally getting into the next color. Here's red. We're going to look at Rapid Flames. This is four mana, three and a red for a sorcery, and it deals one damage to each of up to three target creatures. Those creatures can't block this turn. That's actually fine. Again, mostly for red sideboards and limited, you'll almost always want a piece like this available in the environment. So here it is. We got it. That's kind of all I got to say about it. <laughs> you know, if you want to get through for combat damage in red, it's a pretty good way of doing it in the late game. But let's move on to Satyr's Cunning, which I actually think might have a chance in standard. This is just one red mana for a sorcery. You create a 1-1 red Satyr creature token with... This creature can't block, and you can escape this for two red, and you exile two other cards from your graveyard. So two other cards is a really, really low count. So if you're just trying to get your storm count up, or if you're just trying to count cast multiple cards for, say, Arclight Phoenix, which is probably where this goes the best, then Satyr's Cunning might actually be a really sweet one-drop. It might actually work out, you know, and there's going to be turns later on in the game where you can effectively cast two copies of Satyr's Cunning, whether you have to you know, pay four mana or pay six mana. You can, ca you can cast two copies of Satyr's Cunning in the same turn fairly easily, so I actually think this might have a real chance just because it's a one red mana sorcery that creates a creature, develops your board state, that's totally cool, but it also adds to your storm count. You know, you can, um, in anything that effectively has prowess and pumps whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, this is good for, you know, things like Niv-Mizzet that you know, pop for damage when you cast instant or sorceries and stuff like that. It's just all really good with a card like Satyr's Cunning because it's such a really low investment to get started and still a fairly low investment to keep going. So I think Cunning is actually a much better card than it might look like at first glance. And really, I've desired an effect like that a lot. So we'll see if it sees any play. But let's move on to Portent of Betrayal, four mana. Three and a red for a sorcery. Gain control of target creature to the end of turn. Untap that creature against haste to the end of turn. And then you scry one. So they're just tacking a scry one onto active treason. And they're charging you an extra mana for it, which is fine. Again, red almost wants, almost always wants access to this effect in the limited environment. So, you know, this, this is the one this time around. This is your active treason. And scry one is actually a pretty good little tack on to that effect. So I'll take it. I'll at least play it in the sideboard and very often in the main deck. 
if I don't have like good creatures I want to throw in there. But moving on to Nick's Born Brute. This is five mana, three and two red for an enchantment Cyclops, and it's a seven three. That's the entire card. The stat line is somewhat impressive, although you know, I think I've made this clear a few times this season and beyond that I am not a huge fan of low toughness creatures, especially at this kind of mana cost at five. That is just a bit much, so I'm not super sure about it. However, we just saw like an aura in this video that grants trample. There's shadow sphere that grants trample, so it's possible you'll be able to get a bunch of damage in with this, with an aura or an equipment or something. So maybe if you've got the right cards already in your sealed pool, Nyxborn Brood could go in, but I'm a little bit wary about five drops that die to, you know, two and three drops. I'm a little, I'm a little worried about it, but move on here. To irrevel irrelevant, I always want to say irrelevant, <laughs> irreverent revelers. <laughs> say that five times fast. Irreverent revelers is three mana, two and a red for a two-two satyr. And when it enters the battlefield, you choose one. Either destroy target artifact or revelers gains haste until end of turn. Pretty decent, not standard playable or anything. I don't think. I mean, maybe it's, uh, maybe possibly. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this effect in red. And we've seen people play like Ember of Shieldbreaker in the main deck. So maybe, but again, I, I somewhat doubt it. Um, unless artifacts become like very serious. But maybe, maybe they will. Shadow Spear looking at you. Also Ember Cleave. Um, Great Hinge. There are some, but <laughs> I'm still not sure about it for standard play. But again, in limited, this is quite decent. You know, it's at the very least a three mana two two haste. And you could do you could do worse. So it's a decent again like twenty second creature. But let's move on to Eroes' blessing right here. This is just three and a red. For an aura that enchants a creature you control. And when it ETBs it deals four damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and that is how you do it. That is how you make an aura. Again, breaking the rules here of what auras mean, because again, usually you're worried about getting two for one, but when you play this, you get a removal spell. That's going to kill something. I mean, four damage is an awful lot, so you're going to kill something with it, and you're going to give a creature a little bitty bonus, not too much, but what you're really paying for is the removal here, so it's worth it, especially at the common level in limited. You're going to play pretty much every piece of removal you can get your hands on that's halfway worth playing, and this is way more than halfway worth playing. This is a great red common, so... Big fan. I guess the only downside is you have to have a creature on your side of the table in the first place to actually cast it, but like, I don't care. I, I don't, who cares? But <laughs> moving on to uh, Infuriate, I'm not going to click on this one because this is a reprint. It's just one mana for plus three, plus two at instant speed. In red, it's the red giant growth. You'll play it, especially with all these creatures that, um, you know, whenever you target them, they give all your creatures plus one, plus so. You'll, so you'll play Infuriate, but especially in these really aggressive decks. Let's move on to Incendiary Oracle. This is two mana, one and a red for a 2-2 two, two human shaman. And you can pay one and a red to have uh, Incendiary Oracle get plus one, plus zero till end of turn. Now, if a creature dealt damage by Oracle, this turn would die. You exile that creature instead. Really, really neat in a format full of graveyard strategies. There are a whole bunch of escape creatures, like even at the common level, there are a bunch of escape creatures. So this is a nice little, you know, safety valve. For those creatures and it's got decent stats in and of itself so more than playable in limited they kind of juiced it with the uh the fire breathing ability honestly it, it, they didn't even have to put that on it it would be somewhat playable but even more so now and it can pump to kill all kinds of stuff that it shouldn't have any business killing so yes to that but moving on to dream stalk a manticore this is three mana two and a red for a four two manticore and whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn dream stalker manticore deals one damage to any target that's so good there's a really good card for for this deck i really like this archetype in limited i don't know it's got a bunch of payoffs but i don't know if it has like the gas that it needs you know because you're, you're probably not gonna be able to do this every single turn but on turns where you can take out that you know one toughness creature with your three mana four two again the stat line is at least sort of decent you know if, if they let it through for combat damage it's it's smacking them for a lot so stat line's decent you know it can sometimes pick off small creatures that is a really good creature right there so if you're looking for even more payoffs for this this archetype and limited you got one mana core is really good but we're getting into the black cards now <coughs> after i cough excuse me i'm also going to take a little sip of the coffee if you if you don't mind hold on had to wet my whistle, which you probably want me to because I'm starting to sound like rough already this video. But let me, <laughs> whoops, let's move on <laughs> to Venomous Hierophant. That's the first time my mic has fallen since I've changed the way that I uh, arrange it. But anyway, <laughs> Venomous Hierophant is four mana, three and a black for a 3-3 three, three Gorgon Cleric with Death Touch. And when it ETBs, you put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. 
kind of nice. You know, I, I just love Death Touch creatures in limited, like always, pretty much always. So you don't have to sell me too much on Death Touch, but you know, hill giant stats with Death Touch, and you get some escape fuel. You know, I'll take it. Again, a lot of like good twenty second and twenty third card action. I don't think it's like super solid, but it's still a, a, a solid. It's at least solid uh, limited creature, but. Moving on to Underworld Dreams. Excited about this one. We all knew, if you'd seen the leaks, you knew this card was in the set. But this is like one of the reprints that I'm most hyped for. Uh, right now, if you try to buy the Underworld Dreams from, I think it's Legends. Um, it is Legends. Uh, it's like 40 bucks or something. So it's like really, really high. Although that art looks so good. It's such a good looking magic card. But, you know, I've been playing magic for 25 years. And so this might not look like super impressive to some people. But there was a point where Underworld Dreams was a sort of legendary card. It, it, it brought with it a reputation for being a very good magic card. I'm not sure that it still is in this day and age, but it is three Black Devotion pips, and that's really, really good, plus you're punishing a bunch of different kind of decks for drawing extra cards. So could be, could be decent, especially if you're forcing your opponent to draw cards in one way or another, folio of fancies or something, I guess. <laughs> like Maybe Underworld Dreams could be a fun little combo. So Again, I'm not super sure how great it is. It doesn't actually affect the board in any way other than throwing an enchantment down when it comes out. So Underworld Dreams isn't as good as it used to be by our current standards. When games used to go way longer and magic was a way dirtier game and you could just dark, you could dark ritual this out on turn one, back in those days, Underworld Dreams was a very dangerous card i no longer think that it is but it is a really cool card that i will always have like a ton of love in my heart for it but anyway let's move on to rage scarred berserker right here everybody this is five man four and a black for a five four minotaur berserker and when an etb's target creature you control gets plus one plus so and gains indestructible until end of turn so this is really sweet i wish you could flash it in and honestly for five mana you ought to be able to like take a point a PT off of it and let me flash it. <laughs> Come on, right? But still, you are getting a 5-mana five 5 power creature, which is uh, kind of good enough on its own. But you also get a sweet little attack step, you know, a guilt-free attack step with a creature, and that could be really good too. So I don't mind. I don't mind it at all. You might be able to break the game with one indestructible attack step. But we'll move on to Omen of the Dead, which is another one of the cards from today that I think might actually have a chance of breaking into standard play. It's just one black mana for an enchantment with flash. And when it ETBs, you return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. You can also pay two in a black sack. It's cry two like all the other omens, which is... I always I keep like running past it like it doesn't matter. But that ability does actually matter. It's a good mana sink in the late game if you draw dead, so... I like it, but what I really like is that this is just an instant speed raise dead. That also triggers enchantment strategies and stuff, which might really matter. I just, I don't know. I'm, I, something tells me that this is a very good card because literally raise dead, like it's not even a more expensive raise dead, just the card raise dead at instant speed is probably great. That's probably really, really good. So I just, I like it for no other reason than that. But of course, Triggering enchantment strategies and synergies and whatnot is going to be a big game, too. So I really like Omen of the Dead, and something's telling me that it might be standard playable. But let's move on to Nyx Born Marauder. This is just a 4-mana four 4-3. Four, it's a Minotaur, so it's got the right creature type, but I guess we don't have to spend too much time on that. It's a decent stat line, I guess. But here we are on Minion's Return. This is 2 and a black. For an aura that can flash, it enchants a creature. When enchanted creature dies, return that card to the battlefield under your control. So for three mana, you're effectively getting an instant speed save my guy from death card, which is good. That's okay. Especially considering it does trigger any aura strategies or anything. You know, I like that it works with Hateful Eidolon. Like if you've got an Eidolon out and something's about to die, flash this onto it. It'll still die and come back to the graveyard, but you get to draw a card because you got an Eidolon out. So that, that seems neat. But, um... You know, aside from that, not a huge fan. I like stuff like this that's instant speed save a creature, but I don't like three mana instant speed save a creature. That's You have to hold up a lot of mana to pull it off, so we'll have to wait and see. But Funeral Rites is three mana, two and a black for a sorcery. You draw two cards, lose two life, but the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. So this is just way better in a lot of cases than, you know, read the bones or cards like it. Because putting two cards in your library or to your uh, graveyard is great. That's just, that's great. You know, against mill, it's not good, but against pretty much everything else, you're just giving yourself access to more cards. You're giving yourself access to escape fuel. You're giving yourself access to escape cards or jumpstart cards. It's just, that's so good. Like some of the time, like if you, if you turn over a chemist's inside or any other jumpstart card, you're kind of drawing three cards off of this. That's great. 
<laughs> you know, these cards have seen play in standard sparingly, but they have seen play in standard from time to time, and they're always good and sealed to make sure you get you know your fourth land drop or whatever. So, just just a fantastic card that I love at the common level. But let's move on to a card I like more than I should. This is Fruit of Tiserius or Tiserius Tiserius. This is just one black mana. For a sorcery, target player loses two life. You can escape it for three and a black, exile three other cards. So mono black burn, got a thing, you know. I just, I really like mono black burn, burn as an archetype. It's such a great meme. And sometimes it actually works. This is actually kind of a good piece for it. It doesn't affect the board whatsoever in any way, even after you escape it. No, you, sir, do not affect the board or madam. Um, and that kind of sucks. <laughs> but at the same time, I will take... I will take, you know, a repeatable you lose two life thing. Because if you just cast this two times over the course of a game, eh, it's four life. Eh, it's four life. So, you know, it's just kind of a, a black shock that only hits players. I'm really looking to make Mono Black Burn a real thing. Y'all know. The longtime viewers of the channel know that I was already working on a couple of Mono Black Burn decks. You've seen my my arena stash of decks. You know it's up there. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about Fruit. <laughs> kind of am. The art is cool too, but I'm going to move on. I'm way too excited about that card. It's an aspect of Lamprey. Like, seriously, Fruit of Tiserius might be, like, one of the worst cards in the set. It might actually be, but I'm, I'm excited. But Aspect of... Oh, my God. Aspect of Lamprey. That was probably a huge noise. I am so sorry. But Aspect of Lamprey is four mana, three and a black for an aura. Enchants a creature you control. And when it ETBs, target opponent discards two cards. Enchanted creature has lifelink. That's good. That's pretty good. Lifelink is a very good ability, um, especially, again, in the limited environment. But I'm a huge fan of Lifelink on creatures in just about any format. Kind of a sucker for Lifelink. But for format, I'm not sure this is standard playable or anything. But again, every color has a way to break the rules of auras. You know, you're never going to get two for one on this because your opponent has to get rid of two cards as soon as it hits the table. So that's just such that's such an interesting, like, perfect take on how to make an enchantment decent in the first place or an aura at least so kind of a big fan of this especially in the sealed environment but let's move on over to blue move on over baby and look at trident wave rider this is four mana three and blue for three three merfolk wizard good creature types there kid and it has constellation whenever one of them enchantments etbs under your control uh wave rider gains flying till end of turn so you've effectively got a four mana three three flying so long as you can play an enchantment every turn you probably can't in most games of sealed but you can play an enchantment like the turn after you play this the turn after that very likely you can you can work that out so even if it doesn't have flying at the time it's a four mana three three fly or four mana three three you know hill giant um, at the common level so it's at least you know decent limited filler but when you do give it flying it's actually a really really good creature so i'm a fan I'm a fan of that. And there's also Trinity Singer. Is that right? Thrin Thrinody. It's got to be Trinity. It's a two mana, one and a blue for a one, three siren with flash and flying. And when an ETB's target creature and opponent controls gets minus X minus O till end of turn, where X is your devotion to blue. So this is like a, what is it? Fairy Vandal? I can't remember the name of it. Um, but yeah, we, we just saw a creature like this, and it actually sees like incredibly sparing standard play. Almost never at the top tables, but it has been in a deck or two here or there. These flash decks, these tempo decks, and this is like mostly way better. The creature's always going to get minus one, minus zero, because you've always got at least the one devotion to blue. But very often, the creature you're flashing this into block or whatever is going to get like minus three, minus four, minus oh. Late in the game, you can give a huge creature minus six or seven, minus zero, so... You can just really, you know, take a creature out of combat effectively for a turn with this and, and still advance your board state on your opponent's turn. I think it's a very good card. Just a 2-mana 1-3 flash flying would kind of be okay by itself, honestly, just on stats alone. That's kind of good. You know, flash it in to block a 2-power flyer or something, but the fact that it has this cool ETB trigger is actually really, really sweet. So I like it as a devotion payoff, but mostly in sealed i'm not sure how it how much it goes out of limited but it could be a standard playable card that's i mean those are all good things that it does at a good rate but i'm on to nick's born sea guard now this is just a four mana two five that's all it is it's also an enchantment creature i guess so there's that and five toughness is a really good stat line so i'm not saying it's not playable but it's not really worth talking about so let's move on to metamize prophecy two mana one and a blue for a saga you can uh, on chapter one you scry two 
As soon as it ETBs, scry two. On chapter two, you choose a card name and do nothing else. <laughs> on chapter three, when you cast a spell with the chosen name for the first time this turn, you draw two cards. And then on chapter four, you look at the top card of each player's library, which is kind of a ho-hum ability, but I don't want to uh, say this is bad. This might, again, be one of the more standard playable cards from today, triggering any enchantment synergy, synergy that you might have. Also, eventually puts an enchantment in the graveyard, which you might very well want if you want to escape something or something like that. There's all kinds of reasons why sagas are really good in this upcoming format but i really like the first and third modes i really do you kind of have to give away on chapter two you have to give away what you choose what you're what you're going to play next turn um but that might not be such a huge deal right you know and even if the spell that you cast gets countered or something you still draw the two cards it's whenever you cast a spell with the chosen name for the first time so even if you don't resolve the thing you want to play because you're giving your opponent advance notice um, you still get to draw the two, which is really good for an initial investment of only two mana. That's what I really want to drive home here, is that even though it takes a few turns to get going, and Chapter 2 doesn't really do much of anything, it seems, um, this is, for two mana, a scry two and a draw two cards, which is insane at a two mana rate, even if you have to wait a couple of turns. That's just very good. So this might actually be possibly one of the best cards of the entire day. For what that's worth, I'm not really sure what deck plays it on day one, but that's such a low rate at, with, with two really powerful abilities that I think this might actually be like a super playable card in a, in a deck or two here or there. Plus, it's got super sweet art, but let's move on to Illyrios Enraptured. It's uh, Narcissus. This is three mana, two and a blue for a 2-3 legendary human, and when it uh, ETBs, it enters tapped. And it doesn't untap during your untap step if you control a reflection. When Illyrios enters the battlefield, you create a 3-2 blue reflection creature token. So if you can find a way to untap Illyrios himself, then you've gotten, you know, six power, or excuse me, five power worth of stats for three mana. That's pretty good on two creatures. That's, I mean, that's not bad at all. And what's really sweet here is that, you know, you effectively get a three mana, three, two. And if it dies in combat, well, you still got a two, three that starts on tapping from that moment on. So I think this is a really good uncommon. I'm not sure that it transcends, you know, limited play, but I think it is really good in limited play because it's kind of re almost removal proof if you want to look at it that way. But all in all, the stat line on this is actually really, I mean, five, five worth of stats for three mana. Is really good, and if again, if you can untap Illyrios, then that's that's a lot of a lot of stats for a really low investment. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. There could be tricks, but even if there's not tricks, just getting a three-two that even if it dies, you still leave a two-three behind. That's good. So, moving on to Phalanx Tactics. This is one and a white for an instant. Target creature you control gets plus two plus one till end of turn. Each other creature you control gets plus one plus one till end of turn. That's so good. That's so good, <laughs> you know, especially considering when you, you, you know, you, you account for all the kind of heroic creatures in this format that give all your creatures plus one plus oh whenever they get targeted. So you yeah, target them with this and then all your other creatures effectively get plus two plus one as well in that case. So that could be a great finisher for, you know, some sort of aggro deck or a go wide deck in sealed or in draft. I just I really like phalanx tactics. As a matter of fact, it could transcend. Honestly, honestly, this could be a finisher for like a mono white weenie deck. It really could. It, it could be that good. But I'm not too sure about that line of play. And I, 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 I'm not too sure. But this is like really, really good in um in limited for all for all intents. If you're just building an aggressive deck, this is fantastic. But well, let's move on to Leonin of the Lost Pride. It's a two mana three one. It's a cat warrior. And when it dies, you exile target card from an opponent's graveyard. So I kind of like two mana three ones in limited, you know, they can take out three and even four drops. We've seen, you know, four drops with hill giant stats that are effectively thrill of three threes. So this can sometimes take out four drops and exile escape stuff. This is actually, I think, a very playable card on stats alone. But I'll move on here to, oh my God, this might, okay, y'all, this might be the best card of the day. This is Karametra's Blessing. This is just one white for an instant. Target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. If it's an enchanted creature or an enchantment creature, it also gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. That's freaking nuts, though. That's nuts. Like, it's probably not better than God's Willing, especially in decks like Feather and stuff that want it, you know, because it, it can't take, it, it won't give any of its creatures hexproof or indestructible. But in these, you know, uh, aura decks, these enchantment creature decks, you know, probably green-white, but also could be Black White or Abzan or something. In any of those decks, 
this looks freaking phenomenal and could even go along with God's willing. You know, you play six or eight between this and God's willing. Um, just one mana for this effect is so good. It's so good for, you know, it's like dive down. It's like a white, more aggressive dive down. And if you need, I don't, I don't, I don't know why you'd need more selling on the card than that because dive down was insanely playable. Didn't even give the creature indestructible at instant speed, just the hexproof and a toughness bonus. And that just, that saw play in mono blue tempo, you know, from day one until it rotated. So I see this being very much the same, but for aggressive decks, and there's very likely going to be more aggressive decks than there were, you know, tempo decks, right? So I could definitely see this going, especially in the, you know, any of these small ball sort of, you know, Abzan or black, white or green, black, white um, enchantress decks, because a lot of these look like they might be, you know, starting off with one drops, hateful Eidolon and all seed of life's bounty and all that. Um, and then just throwing enchantments on them, or Ginger Brood, for instance, and then just throwing all the glitters on them. But you got to protect those creatures, and this is like the best way of doing it. It's just one mana for this effect is outrageous. Like, that's so criminal. That is a really good card, everybody. But let's move on to Glory Bearers. This is four mana, three and a white for a human cleric that's an enchantment creature. And whenever another creature you control attacks, it gets plus zero, plus one until end of turn, so it's like fortifying provisions from the last set. But it's a creature with halfway decent stats. So I actually kind of like this, <laughs> you know, unlike provisions, you're not taking a turn off from developing your board state. You're actually playing a decently statted body and you're giving all of your creatures like a pretty good little cushion, you know, plus one or plus zero plus one doesn't sound like much, but it can make a huge difference in limited where everything's kind of, you know, it's kind of balanced. So <laughs> just that extra little plus zero plus one can wreak havoc on some opponents, but move on to flicker of fate, which is exactly, it's a flicker. You know, it's exactly what it sounds like. Just two mana, one and a white for an instant. Exile a creature or enchantment. Then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So the only difference between this and your normal flicker or blink card is that it can also target enchantments, which is great if your opponent is trying to kill one of your enchantments. You know, it's really nice to see this as sort of a little bit of built-in protection against, it's an answer to the answers. <laughs> and I like I like that. You know, Wizards is thinking galaxy brain on this. Not only did they give enough answers, but they gave answers to the answers. So that, that could really lead to some dynamic play. But anyway, here's Dreadful Apathy right here. This is three mana, two and a white for an aura that enchants a creature. And that enchanted creature can't attack or block. You can also just pay the casting cost again, two and a white, and exile the creature it's enchanted on. That's actually really good because there's a lot of bonuses for playing enchantments in this format. You know, things like a constellation. There's some things that give you bonuses for having enchantments on stuff right <clears throat> there's some things that search up aura specifically like siona so this can do all of that but it can also just function as effectively a removal piece that maybe gives your opponent like one turn to actually get rid of apathy but if they don't get rid of apathy you can just pay some more mana and get rid of the creature forever exile it too so it can't escape so you know, a really good piece of common removal for the limited environment i'm not sure it goes too far out of there but at least in limited this might be one of the best pieces of removal you have access to Let's move on to Daybreak Chimera. I like this thing a lot. This is just um, just five mana for a 3-3 flying Chimera. But here's the deal. It actually costs X less to cast, where X is your devotion to white. So if you just have three white pips, this only costs two mana for a 3-3 flyer. That's so good. Now, it's going to be almost impossible to get this on an early turn. But there might be games where you can cast, like, I don't know, even a Linden. You don't have to do anything on the first couple of turns. But even if you just cast a Linden turn three and it stays out, you could double daybreak chimera on the next turn that's good <laughs> so, or even if like you know uh turn one one drop turn two two one drops that both have white pips and then turn three you can play this and another one drop that seems good right so there's definitely ways you could make this worth it and i think it might be a, a card for mono white um mono white weenie or something in the upcoming format just three three flying for effectively two mana on a lot of boards is gonna be really doable like that's that might be worth the slot in your deck because 3 3 Flying is like one of the meatiest creatures you could play in White Weenie right now. So, And like Mono White Flyers is a real deck that, that I've done stuff with before. So this goes slots directly in, you know. I just, I like it. I like this a lot. And that's outside of Limited, but in Limited, it's freaking phenomenal. So I'm going to move on to Captivating Unicorn. This is five mana, four and a white for a 4-4 four, four uni. And it's got Constellation. Whenever an enchantment ETBs into your control, you tap target creature and opponent controls. That's Dece. That's Dece, you know, it's a 5-mana 4-4, four, four, which is good stats in and of itself, and it's a tapper. And if you play multiple enchantments in a turn, it can be a really effective tapper that can get in for, you know, a lot of damage. So, I like Captivating Unicorn. I mean, again, a lot of the colors got really good commons today, but we're kind of moving into 
the home stretch. Let's let's take it home, everybody. Here's Wings of Hubris. This is uh, two mana for an artifact. That's an equipment. Equip creature has flying, and it equips for just one. And if that's where all that was all it did, it, that would be kind of good. But you can sacrifice Wings of Hubris to have equip creature not be able to be blocked this turn. Then you sacrifice the creature at the beginning of the next end step. So it's kind of an Icarus's wings situation, which is very cute flavor. Um, <laughs> actually, really like this card a lot in limited. Uh, but probably not too far outside of limited. I will say that giving the creature unblockable might actually be really, really good. Um, even even in standard, you know, any deck has access to this. There's probably some really cool, like, dank jank <laughs> kind of tricks you can put in the jank bank. But aside from that, this is mostly a limited card. But I think a pretty playable limited card. You know, giving the creature flying is a big deal. And sometimes just being able to one-shot for the victory, even after your opponent plays a flyer, might be really good. So... I'm going to move on to Traveler's Amulet, which we don't have to talk about too much. You know, if you've never seen Traveler's Amulet, it's just a one-mana artifact. You pay one, tap it, or you pay one and sack it to search your library for a basic, put it in your hand, uh, which is playable. It's actually been playable in multiple standard decks. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to go out on a limb here and say it's bad. Traveler's Amulet is tried and true. So let's move on to Mirror Shield here. Just two mana for an equipment that equips for two. Equipped creature gets plus zero, plus two, and has hexproof, and whenever a creature with death touch blocks or becomes blocked by this creature, destroy that creature. So what this really is, is another sort of swift foot boots for your commander deck, kind of, you know? Just giving your commander hexproof is going to be a big deal. I mean, it is, you know, and even the plus zero, plus two might be a big deal, but this is just another equipment that gives your commander hexproof. So if you don't have swift foot boots or if you want another copy of it or lightning greaves or whatever, then a uh, mirror shield is there for you. That's actually could be really good just in the commander environment. But even outside of that, you know, in limited, this is fantastic. Just negates death touch effectively, but also gives creatures hexproof, which is a huge deal. That's just the most important word on the entire card is hexproof. Right there, ladies and gentlemen, that is that is a very, very good word, although it is a little expensive to cast and then equip. Four mana is kind of a lot to ask, but being able to, you know, negate Death Touch is actually kind of a big game in this format against Falmar Knights and especially Questing Beasts. So, I don't know, not really Falmar Knight, but especially Questing Beasts. But I'm not saying this sees standard play, I really doubt that it does, but Hexproof. Hexproof is, that's a freaking good ability to put on a creature so i'm gonna move on to bronze sword which is just an equipment that you pay one for the equip creature gets plus two plus oh but the equip cost is three so the equip cost the equip cost is quite a bit quite an awful lot on this but i probably still play one copy of it in um aggressive uh decks if i didn't have enough creatures to play or something i'd probably play one copy of this in limited but there's plummet it's just a story of creature flying we've all seen plummet cost two mana it's an instance good but uh <laughs> there's also ferris brand brawler Ferris Band Brawler, excuse me. Six mana for a 4-4 four, four Centaur Warrior, and when it enters the battlefield, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. That's so good. <laughs> you know, Black just got a creature like this the other day, a six mana, like 3-2, that uh, kneecaps a creature by your devotion to Black, and that's pretty good too, but this is, you know, in a color that doesn't usually get access to removal. It is the fight mechanic, so that could suck. I mean, there's going to be multiple times where you just play this as a six mana removal spell that doesn't even stay on the table, right? But most of the time you're going to play this, kill something, and still have a 4-4 four, four out, in which case it's just absolutely ludicrous. So that's that's a very good uncommon to, to be on the lookout for, but let's move on. To Nylea's front runner here, four runner. Five mana, four and a green for a five three enchantment. Beast with trample. Other creatures you control have trample. Again, it's great. It's so good. Five mana, five power creatures, good enough. Don't like the toughness, but still, it's fine. It does have the trample, which, you know, eases the pain a little bit. And then other creatures you control have trample is so good. It's so, it's so good, especially on a board full of, you know, pretty reasonably sized creatures. This is just effectively reach in the late game. Not the keyword ability reach, but the, the concept reach. You can win the game out of nowhere with this card. You know, you could you could actually use it as sort of an overrun kind of effect if you wanted to. Um, and just give all your creatures trample. This doesn't even have to attack. You just win on that turn. It could work. But moving on to Nessie and Horn Beetle here. This is two mana for a 2-2 two, two insect. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control another creature with power four or greater, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Nessie and Horn Beetle. So if it's got something to back it up, it gets... It's a little bit more, you know, antsy every turn, um, which is actually pretty cool. You know, sometimes this can grow from just a two mana two two 
into like a two mana four four five five pretty easy depending on how long the game goes so again in limited yes to this all day and even this like could maybe be decent and standard but i really doubt it like I really, really doubt this is standard playable, but you know, if you do have two or three turns where you have a love struck beast out or something, and this suddenly becomes for just a two mana investment comes a five five. You know, this could have easily been a two mana one one that grows, but a two mana two two that grows is a whole different ball game because it starts at a pretty decent stat line in the first place. So if it ever just gets one plus one plus one counter, you you kind of got a really good rate. So I do like the card, but I don't think that it usurps any other two drops that we're playing in standard right now. But moving on to Hyrax Tower Scout. This is two and a green for a, two, a three three human scout, and when it ETBs, you untap target creature. Pretty freaking sweet. Now note that you have to untap a creature. <laughs> so I guess sometimes it'll just untap itself, even though it's not tapped. Like you, you can just target itself, and yes, you can. Even if it's you know untapped, you can still untap it. Um, but in any case, this is actually pretty sweet because it can just give a creature a form of pseudo vigilance after it attacks for the turn, which can make all the difference this early in the game. And just a three mana three three is good. That's good and playable and limited. So good card right there, everybody. I mean, they're all good cards, aren't they? Uh, Gift of Strength, for instance, it's two mana, one and a red for an instant, one and a green for an instant. Turret creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains reach until end of turn. That reach might make a huge difference in the upcoming environment, because you might play this anyway. I mean, you might just play this as a combat trick one way or the other, because it's a decent combat trick, but, you know, adding reach to it is going to take out a bunch of flying creatures with relatively small creatures, so I think that's actually a great card, too, and I'd probably play one copy of that in an aggressive green deck, but... Moving on, we got Underworld Fires here. This is one in red for a sorcery. Underworld Fires deals one damage to each creature and each planeswalker. If a permanent dealt damage this way would die this turn, exile it instead. I wish this was better against the cat decks, but it's it's not really. So, <laughs> you know, that kind of sucks. But this could be a decent sideboard card if we see a bunch of, you know, X ones. For instance, I know this is a red card, but this actually plays pretty well against mono red. <laughs> For what that's worth, you know, kills all their Scorch Spitters and Ten Street Dodgers and Ginger Brutes and all that. So kind of kind of neat in that in that way. It could be a decent sideboard card because one damage to everything is actually kind of good sometimes. But and the Exile Clause is just candy. That's good. But Stampede Rider here is three mana, two and a red for a two, three Seder with Trample. And at the beginning of each combat, if you control a creature with power four or greater, Rider gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. So it just becomes, you know, three, four for three mana if you got a big dude. And it tramples too. I mean, again, the stat line's okay. Three mana, two, three trample. Not the not not much to write home about. It's not a great stat line, but it's not a terrible stat line either. And if it ever grows the point of power toughness, then it's actually pretty decent considering what you paid for it. So let's move on. To Scofos War Leader. Four and a red for a four or five Minotaur Warrior. And you can pay a red and sacrifice another creature or enchantment to have War Leader get plus one plus O and gain Menace until end of turn. So, over the last few days, we've seen a sort of red or red black sacrifice deck come together in the limited environment. Like, it's a limited archetype in this set. And they're all like Minotaurs. And Minotaurs apparently like to sacrifice stuff. <laughs> you know? And this actually is good, you know, like. I hate sacrificing a creature. I hate, like, you know, depleting board state, but being able to make this a 5-5 five, five menace is actually really intimidating. Like, that's that's a that's a good creature to be swinging with, so. And honestly, a 5-mana four, a 4-5 five four, five isn't bad stats in and of itself, but if you're getting, like, you know, sacrifice triggers off of this, or maybe you're, you know, putting stuff in the graveyard, you can then escape back. There's a lot of different ways I could see abusing War Leader. It's just, it's decent stats in and of itself, but if you ever actually activate it, it can do some real damage, but... I'm going to move on to Impending Doom. This is a cool card. Two and a red for an aura. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus three, plus three, and attacks each combat if able. When enchanted creature dies, Impending Doom deals three damage to that creature's controller. So you can throw it on one of your opponent's creatures and then kill that thing with like a removal spell or kill it in combat even. And then you get to bolt their 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 controllers. So that's kind of good. But mostly what this is for is you're trying to throw this on one of your creatures with like a red oaken form or something and just go to town with like a double striker or something, which you, you definitely could do in red, um, in limited. And just kill your opponent before they ever actually kill the creature, you know. It is a little bit uh, a little bit risky, but still, three mana for plus three plus three forever is pretty good. So, move on to Flummox Cyclops here. Just four mana for a four four reach with downside. Whenever two or more creatures your opponents control attack, Cyclops can't block this combat. Boo, 
you know, like why give it reach? Because <laughs> you know? very often two or more creatures are going to attack on your opponent's side. So just reach isn't even going to matter. But I guess a four mana four four is good stats. It's good stats. So it's just another card that like if you've got, you know, one more slot in your limited deck, you probably want to play it, especially if you're aggressive, you don't care about blocking anyway. So moving on to Vegeta's move. This is a final fl final flash. It's two, uh, two and a red for an instant. As an additional cost to cast a spell, sacrifice creature enchantment, flare deals five damage to target creature. That's kind of bad, but you'll probably still play it, right? <laughs> you'll play it in limited because it's common level removal that kills almost anything. Um, aside from gods and stuff, uh, but it kills just about anything, but you do have to come down on board state for it. Luckily, you'll be able to just sacrifice an enchantment 90% of the time, which you will probably be doing. So It's okay, but I wouldn't go out of my way to play a bunch of them. Um, up next to Aspect of Manticore. This is two and a red for an aura with flash. Enchants a creature. When an ETB's enchanted creature gains first strike till end of turn, but enchanted creature also gets plus two, plus zero. So a pretty aggressive aura here. If you flash it in, it's a great combat trick. Plus two, plus zero, and, um, and first strike is going to make sure your creature kills and survives against almost anything uh, in combat. Depending, depending, but almost anything. The creature, your creature is going to win that exchange, uh, and then just stick around with plus two plus zero forever. That's really good. And if you can use the creature, it, this aura that way, then you've probably blown your opponent out. You know, they thought they were going to win the exchange or at the very least trade. Instead, they lose their creature. Your creature is bigger forever. You don't lose your guy. It's just a blowout if you actually land this right. So I love aspect. It is a little bit pricey, but again, it, it's pricey for a reason. So let's move on to Underworld Charger here. This is two and a black for a 3-3 Nightmare Horse. <laughs> Sweet creature types. And it can't block. You can escape it, though, for four and a black and exile three other cards, and it escapes with two plus one plus one counters on it. So you can escape it five mana, five, five. Not bad. Not really bad at all. But it's also, you know, a three mana, three, three on stats alone when it enters play the first time. So again, in an aggressive deck, this looks fantastic, right? You know, if you don't care about blocking, Charger's really, really good. But... You know, I've said that about a bunch of cards. Maybe this uh, limited environment is trending trending more aggressive than I originally thought. But here's Temple Thief. This is one in a black for a 2-2 human rogue that can't be blocked by enchanted creatures or enchantment creatures. That's pretty decent in this format where it basically means it can't be blocked by a whole bunch of stuff. Now, it can be blocked by a whole bunch of stuff. Don't get me wrong. There is a lot of stuff in this format that can block this. But I just imagine putting a reasonable aura on this and then swinging in with it, you know, staggering inside on this, swing in with it. Um, the, the wolf aura that gives a plus four, plus four, swing in with a six, six, somewhat unblockable. It can be really good, and it's a two minute two, two, so you're probably going to play it in your limited deck anyway. I do like Temple Thief, but let's uh, move it on here to Soul Reaper of Mogus. This is three mana, two and a black for two, three enchantment, Minotaur Shaman. Minotaur. <laughs> <laughs> like a miniature minotaur shaman you can pay two and a black and sacrifice a creature to draw a card very good and limited you know again i don't think that three mana two three is a great stat line but i do think this gets a lot of power from just being an enchantment creature in the first place i think it gets a lot of power by being a mana sink that allows you to not only get sacrifice procs you know because there's a couple of things that proc when you sack but also just drawing cards in the late game that could be worth a creature to you like at the end of your opponent's turn, or maybe you just block and sack a creature if you have the mana open. There's just a lot you can do with a card like this, and it's a Minotaur, so if you want Minotaur synergies, you're getting them. You're getting them, everybody, but let's move on to Farika's Libation. This is two and a black for an instant. Choose one. Target opponent sacrifices a creature, or target opponent sacrifices an enchantment. It's good. Yeah, it's fine. Unlimited, I guess. It's, it's okay. I do like that it's instant speed, you know, you get an edict, edict effect, but, you know, unlike other edict effects, it costs one more, but it also can hit enchantments. So that's kind of good, especially considering, you know, and especially in standard, your opponent's probably not going to have more than like one or two enchantments in play, so it's going to be a tough choice, but I don't think this really transcends into standard, so in case you haven't noticed, I have already moved on to Mogus's Favor. This is just one black mana for an aura that enchants a creature. Enchanted creature gets plus two, minus one. Do not pay attention to the Mythic Spoiler translation because they screwed it up. The actual card is plus two, minus one. Um, you can also escape this for two and a black and exile two other cards from your yard. So a removal enchantment that you can escape. How could that possibly go wrong, right? Like, this is so good and limited, everybody. Make no mistake. <clears throat> this is very often going to be at least 
if not a removal enchantment, then an enchantment that hobbles one of your opponent's creatures so you can kill it in combat. Sometimes that'll make sure that it kills whatever you're blocking with it in combat, but this will hobble a, a high toughness creature to make sure you can deal with it. And that's often going to be how you play it, just as a weakness, effectively. But often, you know, too, sometimes you can just play this on a creature of yours that has rel relatively high toughness. And just give it a power boost if you're more worried about aggression. And then if that creature does die, you can just escape Mogus' favor and make another one of your creatures swole. So I really like this card, especially in Limited. But even in Standard, I have some designs on this card. Again, the sort of hateful Eidolon, you know, the Enchantments deck that's, that's more kind of focused around one and two drops. Like, that deck looks to be really low to the ground. This could go really well and effectively be more copies of Deadweight if you want them. But could be even better than Deadweight. As a matter of fact, goes on Hateful Eidolon to make it a 3-1 lifeline. So that might be somewhat good, too. Just all around big fan of the card. I think there's a lot of uh, versatility on it. But I'm going to move on to Lampad of Death's Vigil. This is two mana, one in a black for a 1-3 nymph. It's an enchantment creature, too. And you can pay one and sack a creature to have each opponent lose a life and you gain a life. I want to be a bigger fan of this. I really do. But it's kind of a sack outlet and a blood artist in and of itself, isn't it, right? But you do have to pay mana for it, which I don't love, but it's only one mana, so maybe? I just think that the, the sack decks have probably better options than a card like this at this point, you know? like. But I guess they, some of them were playing like Mask of Immolation until a couple of weeks ago, so maybe Lampad could actually sub in for that. I'm not actually sure. I'm not sure this is quite where it needs to be, but, you know, late in the game, if your opponent's at three or four, you could easily just sacrifice your entire team to have them, you know, just just drain them out of the game. So I actually think this could see some amount of standard play because there's a mana sink in the late game. You just end the game with this. So maybe possibly. But what else we got? Oh, we're getting pretty close here. Here's Grim Physician coming up next. This is just a black mana for a 1-1 one, one zombie. And when it dies, target creature and opponent controls gets minus one, minus one till end of turn. This is always good. We've seen this on a few cards before, and it's always good in limited every single time might actually be playable in standard it's been playable in standard before a couple of times uh, effects like this on small creatures so especially with this creature type it might be worth it somewhere but even in you know especially in limited where i'm not a huge fan of one drops this can effectively take down two toughness creatures for one mana so that's pretty good on blocks but we'll move on to enemy of enlightenment that's a name it's six mana, five, and a black for a five, five demon with flying. It's an enchantment creature. And it gets minus one, minus one for each card in your opponent's hands. At the beginning of your upkeep, each player discards a card. Pretty neat. It's got the Rotting Registrar thing, but like everybody discards a card. So it gets bigger and bigger as the game goes on. And obviously by the time you cast it, it might just be a natural five, five. Your opponent might be out of cards. Don't think it goes anywhere in standard. It costs way too much. But just as a giant flying threat and limited, I love it. And it punishes players for like slow rolling. So, mmm. I kind of I kind of like it. It's just a big pile of stats, but sometimes it's just going to be a three three, and that's when it's bad. You know, especially when it's a two two or something. Then again, if your opponent has you know five cards in their hand, it just doesn't survive. So <laughs> you got to worry about that too. But I do think that there's going to be a lot of times by the time you get to play this where it's going to be at least a three three or four four, and it's going to punish your opponent in a very specific horrible way every single turn. So it's pretty good. But moving on to Witness of Tomorrow's. Five mana, four and a blue for a three, four. Enchantment Sphinx with flying. You can pay four mana to scry one. Acceptable. You know, I don't love the stat line on it for the mana, but it is a fat flying creature, so you play them, especially at the common level, you play them. And then scry one as a mana sink is good too. I mean, it's just good. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> it's a fine card. So I'll move on to stern dismissal just a blue mana for an instant return target creature or enchantment and opponent controls to its owner's hand pretty decent for one blue mana i mean it kind of gives blue decks an answer to cards like fires for at least one turn or cards like um uh you know trail of crumbs or something i think it's really interesting that like you can tap down your mana now on turn three or four let your opponent like get the fires down kind of maybe like you don't absolutely have to counter the fires on the turn they play it this might be a bad take because you, you usually want to counter the fires, right? You don't want them to get any value out of it. But I will say, like, if you'd rather make a play on turn three or four or something and then say go, if they do play fires, you might still have enough mana left over to stern dismissal the fires back to their hand. And then you just counter it next turn or something. It really all depends on what plays you want to make. Um, as the game goes on. So, like, Stern might be pretty good, especially in the upcoming format as a sort of sideboard piece. We'll have to wait and see, but I do think it's a decent limited playable. Although Bounce is a little iffy and sealed some of the time, this could be really, really good. But 
I'm going to move on to Starlit Mantle here. This is one in a blue for an aura with flash, then enchants a creature you control. When it ETBs, enchanted creature gains hexproof until end of turn, and enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one. That's a very, it's so good. That's so good. <laughs> like, first of all, you can flash it in, so you save a creature at instant speed. That's so good. Plus, you're kind of blowing your opponent out because the creature is even harder to deal with. It's even more of a pain than when they originally cast their removal spell on it. All this for just two mana, which is like the absolute most I'd want to pay for this effect, but that's still like a fair cost for this effect, considering your creature grows you know, for the rest of the game, your creature gets plus one, plus one, and you save it from removal for two mana. That's very good. That's very good and could actually see some amount of standard play, but I highly doubt it considering we've already got, you know, better cards at one mana than this, but especially in limited, mm, huge fan of that. Plus you need, you know, a lot of ways to protect creatures that have auras on them and stuff. And this is a great way of doing that too. So move on to Sleep of the Dead. Just a blue mana for a sorcery. Tap target creature. It doesn't untap during its next uh, untap step. You can uh, escape it for two and a blue and exile three other cards. But I don't really care. <clears throat> because I don't really, really like these freeze effects in limited that much. Sometimes I do. Especially if you can freeze down two of your opponent's creatures. Because you have, you know, four cards and three or excuse me, four mana and three cards. That might be good for getting an attack step in, but it's not going to be like as good as sleep or anything, right? So I could see a world where this is worth your 22nd or 23rd card slot in an aggressive blue deck, but very likely is not. Uh, very likely is not. That said, maybe in a, a blue-red spells deck or something. Maybe, but again, I, I highly doubt it. So I'm going to go ahead and move on here to Sage of Mysteries. This is a single blue mana for a 0-2 human wizard with Constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard. So that's uh, pretty cool, you know, just one mana 0-2 that'll kind of drown secrets, you know, whenever you play an enchantment. So that could be really good, especially combined with drown secrets. So <laughs> it's, I can see this being a sweet piece in mono blue mill or blue black mill or whatever, you know. Pretty cool. Get excited about that, mill players. At least they give you one or two things to get cool with this this uh, this set. But up next is Riptide Turtle, which is effectively um, Crash from Finding Nemo. This is one in a blue. Is that the thing? The name one in a blue for a zero five turtle with flash and defender. That's the entire card. I like it though. <laughs> I really do like this an awful lot, um, especially in the limited environment. You know, it doesn't attack for anything, and it never attacks because it's got defender, but. I, I kind of just like it. If it weren't, maybe if it had a different creature type, I wouldn't like it as much, but I'm charmed by it. Let me just put it that way. I'm infatuated with the turtle. And it really does remind me of, of, of Finding Nemo Turtle, so I'm probably rating a little bit higher. But just a 0-5 flash for two seems like it might be almost playable. Like, even the bad cards look good today. So let's move on to Elite Instructor. There's just two and a blue for a 2-2 human wizard. And when it ETBs, you draw a card, then you discard a card. Great into the battlefield trigger. <laughs> really really good especially in a format full of escape and stuff or even just where you brought a fuel escape you know just just throw an inconsequential card in your graveyard so you can use it as escape fodder later it's just it's all good you know a three mana two two is obviously terrible stats but with that kind of etb trigger yeah i'll play i'll play that card it's good so to move on to deny the divine here so it's two and a blue for an instant counter target creature or an enchantment spell if that spell is countered this way exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard what <laughs> like, three mana is a lot. It's so much for this, but the Exile Clause might actually make it worth it. And in Limited, this is almost certainly playable. But Standard, I think we're kind of looking at a different story. But again, that Exile Clause is a big deal. So, And it does counter, like, fires and stuff. Like, well, maybe, 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 but I doubt it. So I'm going to move on to Chain to Memory. Just one blue mana for an instant. Target creature gets minus four, minus zero till end of turn. Scry two. So honestly, Scry two for a single blue is not bad. <laughs> But I'm still probably not playing this in my limited deck. I really don't like the the one-shot, you know, power cripple effects. I'm not a big fan. So I'm going to move on to Transcendent Envoy. This is one and a white. For a griffin, that's an enchantment creature. And it's also a one-two with flying. Aura spells you cast cost one list to cast. Pretty sweet. I mean, it's a common, too. So this could be, like, pauper playable. I'm totally serious. It could be real faux shiz pauper playable. But it could also be, like, budget standard playable or even real standard playable because it makes sure all the glitters cost one one mana and a bunch of other stuff just cost one mana. I mean, it's, it's actually really, really good, y'all. So we'll see if we can make it work in, like, green-white or black-white auras or something. But all in all, this looks like a really good creature in limited because it's evasive. You can throw auras on it to, to pretty good effect. And all your 
you're always costing one less, it's just a huge game. So I'm going to try to make it work in standard, but we'll have to see. Up next is Sun Main Pegasus. This is a uh, four mana, three and a white for a two, three flyer. You pay one and a white to have uh, Pegasus gain vigilance and lifelink until end of turn. So it does require a pretty decent little mana investment to become a good creature, but like it can become a good creature, right? <laughs> like a two, three flying vigilance lifelink is good-ish, but I don't like that you have to devote mana to it. I will say four mana for a two, three flying is, is not great stats. But at least you get a flying creature. At least it can gain you a little bit of life. It can, you know, play defense and offense. I am a big fan of this. I think it's really versatile. But I'm kind of wary of the initial stats on it. That said, let me go back real quick. If you throw auras on this, then suddenly, you know, you've got a creature with much higher power than just 2-3, depending on the aura. And you can give it Vigilance and Lifelink. So that could be huge. This could be one of the better creatures to enchant in the entire set at the Comet level. But I'm going to actually save Sentinel's Eyes and do a Rumbling Sentry real quick. This is five mana, three and two white for a three, six giant. A lot of giants in this set. And when it ETBs, you scry one. So it's not going to go in like Naya giants and standard or anything, but it's still okay. You know, three, six is really good stats, especially considering we haven't seen a whole lot of creatures with six power or toughness outside of like gods and stuff. We really have not seen that many huge creatures in this set. So six toughness blocks pretty much any, anything and survives. And scrying one could be worse, right? But the card that I'm actually a little more excited about and we're gonna end the day on finally is Sentinel's Eyes. Just one white mana for an R that enchants a creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one and has vigilance, but this escapes by just paying a white mana and you exile two other cards from your graveyard. Two other cards is nothing. Two other cards is literally nothing almost. <laughs> and um, a single white mana is its casting cost. So this like almost feels Rancory, right? Like it's almost, it almost feels like it'll just continue to come back over and over for the entire game at a reasonably low cost to you. Uh, plus one, plus one in Vigilance isn't a whole lot. So you're really looking to get the most juice out of the fact that this is a one mana aura in the first place. Things like Satessan Champion, Hateful Eidolon, all the stuff that gets you value for having auras in the first place this is a great way to sort of abuse that because just one mana to play it in the first place and then escape it at a really low cost in terms of cards, you know, two cards, is just that could be breakable is all I'm saying because one mana is the, the literal lowest you could ever really hope to pay for these kind of effects um, and, and to proc, you know, all these important Enchantment Matters cards. So I actually think you might be seeing a lot of this in standard as sort of an ancillary synergy driven card more than it is a card that's in there because of the power level, right? Because the power level is relatively low, but in terms of synergy, I could see this synergizing extremely well in these Enchantress decks. But so I'm kind of excited about it, especially given the extremely low escape cost, the literal lowest escape cost in the entire set. So I do like it, but that is it. We have, we actually made it everybody. We did it. <laughs> we are, we are through Theros beyond death, but again, don't go anywhere. Don't think that means you get to just leave the channel. We've got the top probably 25 Theros cards coming out next couple of days. Top 10 sleepers, maybe the top 10 budget cards, the video I'm thinking about doing. Um, and a bunch of stuff, just deck techs, you know, again, if you're a patron, if you want to be a patron, voting starts next week on what decks we're going to do when the set comes out. So make sure you're a part of that. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for the notifications for more of the ridiculous content I devote my life to. So do that if you want to reward the fact that I, I literally spend 10 hours a day at a computer. But in any case, I guess uh, do all that YouTube stuff. Hit up the link to TCG Player in the description if you want to pre-order any of this stuff. Now that the entire set's out, we know the full context of things, you might be more kind of, you know, apt to pull the trigger on actually ordering some stuff. If you want to do it, hit the link in the description, go to TCG Player, pick up sealed product or singles at super low prices. But pretty sure I'm donezo for this one so. So I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.